I'm going to talk a bit about migrating to GitLab, which is uh, in the fine tradition of recent talks I've given that talk about um, process approaches and, and, and tooling and things that are somewhat unusual for the kernel community at least. Uh, this talk is a bit special because uh, this time around uh, the talk is before we actually started doing things uh, for real and, and seriously. Uh, just kind of seeing whether, whether getting wider feedback before we start uh, on this endeavor for real uh, is, is like interesting because in the past, yeah, we, we always kind of opened up to the kernel community um, afterwards. So yeah, kind of kind of looking for interesting people. So first a bit more about why I'm going to do this talk, then we're going to look a bit why we, from the graphics side, even look into this, like migrating away from kind of standard kernel patch mailing lists and stuff like that. And then a bunch of details of what we've played around already with experiments and prototypes and, and what we've learned about this GitLab thing. So yeah, why this talk? Oh, oh, why I think migrating to GitLab is kind of relevant for the kernel, at least for kernel graphics, maybe kernel at large. Oh, the, the graphics subsystem DRM is, is kind of tiny part of the kernel or tiny, not so tiny anymore, but still a fairly small part of the kernel. Uh, but it is also a fairly small part of the open source graphics stack. I mean, if you look at the open source graphics stack, there's Vulkan drivers, GL drivers, compositors, stuff, input drivers are kind of bubbling around there. And uh, DRM kind of being in the middle, we had, we had a lot of influencing from, from both sides where we picked up things. Uh, so stuff that DRM and graphics through DRM, I would say, learned from the kernel is uh, Git. We switched over to Git in 2006, which is one year after Git existed, and Git was very much still a rough ride. And I think that has been very, very beneficial for graphics people overall, uh, kind of throwing CVS into the wind. Uh, with that came proper commit messages if you look at the XORG history and go back like 20 years, it's maybe a one-liner about what was done. And now we have like the kernel, nice summaries and commit messages that explain what's going on. Uh, we also kind of adopted the entire approach of iterating on a patch set for developing features. Um, another thing, I, graphics people took over from the kernel is the maintainer model, that you kind of have the benevolent dictator, or DRM was run for like this, X, uh, the X server was run like that, or Wayland was run like that, so we kind of adopted that model quite a bit. But there's also the other, other way around, again, uh, about how you commit patches and stuff. Uh, Mesa was always kind of the Every, every contributor just has commit rights. And uh, the past few years, uh, the committer model kind of moved through graphics and ended up in, in the kernel with the X server and Wayland and, and DRM uh, switching back. Uh, another thing that the kind of kernel graphics was heavily, or is heavily influenced by what the, the OpenGL people are doing is testing and CI. I mean, kernel is also doing testing and CI, but the, the approach, the tooling, the test suite, uh, I think for DRM that was very much led by Mesa people and their test suites. Uh, for historical reasons, every, almost everything is, is MIT licensed. And uh, so, so yeah, that's, there's, there's a lot of kind of going back and forth of tooling and infrastructure and approaches between uh, the kernel through kernel graphics to the wider graphics ecosystem and from graphics uh, to DRM and then maybe to the kernel at large. And I, I think GitLab looks like the next big wave of changes that could roll from like the user space people through kernel graphics to maybe the kernel at large. So that's essentially why I figured this, this would be an interesting talk. It's not gonna happen like this year 
probably not next year, but like the committer model, maybe in a few years, we'll, we'll look at using GitLab pretty ex uh, ex extensively. So what are the pain points with the current process that we pretty much in graphics largely copy pasted from the kernel with patch series that iterate on the mailing list? Uh, there's, there's a few kind of generic things. Uh, one is the, the popularity of uh, get send email. I mean, kernel people kind of learned how this uh, sending out emails works. Uh, if you need to ramp up lots of new PayPal, and graphics is, has been growing quite a lot uh, past few years. Uh, teaching and setting up get send email is not trivial. And if people that haven't done it before, it's, it's, a, it's a little barrier that, that annoys. Uh, versus if you have a, a, a more web-based or Git-based workflow, you just push branches around and click buttons on a, on a web page. That stuff that goes very much more smoothly through corporate variables, you can do get through over HTTPS on the, that people are a lot more familiar with in general. There's also pain points on the admin side the, in the free desktop dot org uh, project, we run our own server infrastructure for all of graphics. And uh, the free desktop admins are a bit annoyed with maintaining that ad hoc bouquet of, of services like a Git server, a, C, a CGIT, a uh, web service, the patchwork instance, the mailing lists. Uh, you kind of don't want to maintain a mailing list service that massively amplifies every email you send to it in 2018, that's, oh, yeah. So uh, that's, that's it. the other aspect, the FDR admins very much would like to, to kind of get to a single integrated solution where they don't have to maintain the duct tape. Someone else does that. And uh, we also have quite a few smaller or bits of pieces of, of kind of the user space graphics stack. Uh, I've heard about VC, uh, the, the VC4 graphics driver for Broadcom, OpenGL, uh, that moved to GitHub because they wanted a more modern uh, infrastructure. But I mean, in the kernel, we have a bit of experience with proprietary infrastructure on building your development process on top of that and how that can go badly. So uh, we did not, we, we experimented around, or free desktop admins experimented around with just dumping everything on GitHub. But that wasn't easy with, with a lot of people. We, We'd like to stay in control of our infrastructure and, and not be kind of at the mercy of some vendor who might or might not get acquired. Um, one thing we've done uh, in the past few years to kind of fill, fill the gaps in, in pure mailing lists is, is patchwork. And, uh, I'll go a bit into details of the following slide, but uh, summary is kind of Patrick is not really the solutions you, you're looking for. I thought of it, that Patrick is like the thing we need. Um, so th there's a bunch of kind of fundamental uh, issues with Patrick. One is uh, in mailing list discussions, the code and the discussions is all interleaved. It's all kind of ad hoc. You, kind of need a human to understand that this comment is for this block and not the similar looking block later on, or kind of making sense of, of, of patch review discussions on, on the mailing list. Uh, parsing all that stuff is reliably so that you can just throw a service at it is, is somewhat tricky uh, because somewhere deep down in the discussion, someone does a proposal with a patch in this form and then patchwork things, this looks like a patch, so let me insert it and see how uh, things, well, this is the new patch and patchwork, so let me test it. And you get the compile filer, uh, which is kind of not so nice. So, so what we've done on the, on the Intel graphics mailing list is if it's not submitted by git send email with the git send email user agent, we assume it's not a patch to kind of avoid these problems. Uh, another fundamental problem with 
Patrick, is you lose a lot of semantics. Like if you start out, you work on a, on a feature, you do your branch, oh, you, you have like a ref lock of all the previous versions in Git. But when you throw that on a mailing list, like the previous version is, is lost. Uh, we try to do some, at least in our fork of Patrick, some, some tricks with trying to reconstruct somewhat automatically what's the previous version. Or the subsystem have uh, rules that you should link to the previous submissions so that you can chain them together. But, but fundamentally, it's kind of, it's information that's there, like the submitter has it, they know what the previous version was, and you dump it on the mailing list and it's lost. And there's a few other things like the baseline, they, they should this patch series apply. So zero day just tries a bunch of branches and trees with some educated guesses about, well, if it was a graphics patch on the graphics mailing list, it's probably more likely a graphics tree that it should apply to. Who knows? Uh, we just have a hard rule, like everything is based on our integration tree. But then you submit a patch to like a stable backport, and again, CI sees it and says, like, this stuff does not apply. Uh, and and the, the other kind of fundamental thing with patch rig is it's kind of side channel on the, on uh, not the main submission thing, the, the, the sort of truth on mailing lists is the mailing list. So it's just uh, a read only view. You can't really comment or review patches on the, in the patchwork or say, yes, I pulled this pull request, thank you. Uh, it's also not really possible to enforce things because it's kind of on the side, so you can't do the standard process of if you fail CI, you're not allowed to push this because it's kind of not integrated in your world flow. So, so that's kind of the patchwork overall. There's, there's a bunch of aspects. Um, specifically, I mentioned it already with the old revisions. Uh, if you're not really carefully maintaining your patchwork and uh, marking old revisions uh, and submissions as, as uh, uh, outdated submissions, or in your email client, like, mark them as red, you, your overview, whether that's your email client, or whether that's patchwork, of what's actually pending and what's no longer relevant is, is clunked up with, with garbage old submissions and, and you don't really have a, an overview of which patches you should look at for merging. Uh, it's also for, for group maintainership models at least, especially I guess if, if the big ones we have with like 10 or 20 committers, it's really hard to synchronize all the inboxes on patchwork. So yes, I looked at this, but someone else, please look at this. Uh, kind of all that coordination of who does the review for what, for which patch series, uh, which I think makes it fairly lossy. Or if you have just like one maintainer, then yes, it's their personal inbox and they're not having a synchronization problem. Uh, this also kind of bit, uh, the following what's going on is there's no one has a standard mail client set up. Uh, we know, I know of managers who are using Outlook to read mailing lists. And uh, I, I can't even understand the pain they're going through, but apparently it's the best thing they have. And, and yeah, kind of all the, all the things about patchwork, uh, trying to fix these things with patchwork, it's, it's kind of better. But it's not really the full solution of, of what we'd like to have that you really only have the current versions of the actually outstanding patch series and not all the old ones and not all the stuff that's merged. But Patrick didn't realize it was merged or they had to make it tooling and not all the stuff that was just an experiment but thrown away again. And kind of a single source of truth and not every maintainer has kind of their own source of truth of what's been looked at and what's not been looked at and what's fallen through the cracks. Uh, and also kind of for, for managers, I mean, uh, Intel pays people to write graphics drivers, so the project managers would like to know what the P 
people they're paying or doing. And getting that overview from a mailing list is, is really hard. Uh, another pain point is, is CI and, and, and kind of tooling. Uh, my experience with CI is you need positive confirmation that yes, your stuff passes, you get a green, green check mark. And with mailing lists, we do that on Intel GFX. With replies, everyone outside of our team hates it because it's even more spam. So there's this kind of the problem of if you want to give positive confirmation, everyone tells you this is you're creating even more spam. There's kind of no uh, good way to give you this information where you get it, when you, where you can see it, when you commit the, the patches, but not anywhere else. Uh, Client-side scripting and parsing patches is, uh, and pull requests is fun. I mean, we have shared scripts and stuff for all the committers. Um, everyone has their own setup. Everyone has their own favorite shell. Everyone has their own favorite email client, and it breaks all the time. Uh, and again, Patchwork helps you with that, so we use Patchwork to track the CI status. So you, you can... You can say it's a warning, or it's pending, or it, it failed, or it succeeded. You can decide whether you want to send out an email to the mailing list, or whether this is just more kind of informational, or while we're still experimenting with the new RCI stage, or on, on not so stable hardware and stuff like that. So it kind of gives you that, that overview in Patchwork. You can see the series, and you can see the CI results. It's there. But it, it's a side channel, again. There's the entire problem with all the old servers are still there, so you, you can't really see the evolution, how things got fixed. So, so that, that's a bit uh, uh, the pain points we're saying, where things are not working perfectly, and I think other projects uh, are doing a better job. And so we started, or free desktop, that means other people than me, started looking at, at different solutions. And, um, so the question is, like, why GitLab? There's a bunch of others, like Pachur from, from Fred, uh, Fedora and stuff. Uh, definitely not GitHub, because of the, we don't want the re-experience BitKeeper situation. So here's the things uh, that made us pick GitLab. So one thing is, it, GitLab downside is an open core business model where they try to sell you the additional things uh, for money. But as far as open core goes, it's extremely reasonable, and I think we can thank Debian, Debian people for making that possible. So the open core baseline GitLab is just MIT licensed, and if you want to contribute, all they want is the developer certificate of origin. No CLA, no paperwork to sign. They do not actually own the copyright for all the stuff in the, in the core version. So, yeah, as, as far as open core business model and software solu open source solutions goes, I think they're, they're the most reasonable. And we looked at other things where this was not the case, where you had to sign CLIs and all that nonsense. Another thing uh, with GitLab is uh, GitLab cares about big project workflows. So I'm, I'm going to go a bit more details on that on the next slide. Uh, this is quite a complicated topic. Uh, Debian has apparently adopted it. Genome has used it. We have quite a bit of overlap with genome people, with known people in, in open source graphics overall. Not so much in kernel, but uh, Kronos, that's the OpenGL and Vulkan standards body, is using GitLab. So all the uh, GL people and Vulkan people are used to it. Uh, so from, from that point of view, uh, we're hoping that it's, it will be a lot easier to learn for, for new contributors or contributors moving around a bit. It also means that I think if, if GitLab, the company, ever goes evil, there's enough people who really use open, open source core to, have a, to be able to sustain it going forward. Free desktop and, and open source graphics alone definitely wouldn't be able to. But I think with the other projects, this is, this is possible to pull off. 
kind of just for that contingency planning. Uh, it has batteries included, so CI is integrated. All the things you kind of want from an integrated solutions are there, issue tracking, everything, which would make the free desktop admins really happy if they could sunset a bunch of uh, services. And yeah, we, there, there was a, a pilot that fabricated but that essentially failed all these points. So that, that's all already shot it again. Um, on the big project workflows, uh, this is definitely really important for the kernel. It's already important for, for graphics, for DRM. We have a bunch of repos, and I would say like the, the Intel and the AMD repo are big enough that you really don't want to merge them together and, and have a big party there. So. Yeah, big projects, uh, I mean, but, it, but you do is the kernel way where you have a single overall tree with forks and pull requests going back and forth, or kind of the X org way where you have multiple repos, uh, multiple projects like the OpenGL stack uh, and the Vulcan, uh, Vulcan stack and the X server and Wayland and, and all these bits and pieces, but still it's, it's multiple repos, it's different people kind of lots of different sub-projects working together. Uh, uh, you want multiple issue trackers, so you can customize it to your use cases. You still want to be able to move issues back and forth, which is something GitLab has supported since a long time, and GitHub, I think, since two weeks. Uh, so, so yeah, that's pretty fundamental. If you have multiple forks and multiple repos and you can't move issues around, it's useless. Uh, yeah, per, per repo, uh, discussion channels, whatever form they have, uh, patch queues or submission queues or whatever it is. And GitLab, from what I understand, very much cares about big project uh, workflows. One example is the, uh, the moving the issues around. Uh, another one is if you have like for, uh, forks of repos, you can, after the fact, reestablish the fork relationship. And you need to do that to do pull requests or the, the U, use the UI for pull requests. So on GitHub, if you push a kernel repo, and there's another one who pushed a kernel repo, you can't send GitHub pull requests, which makes it useless. Uh, they are working on something they call a super poll, where you could, on the kernel, it would be a topic branch that you can send to multiple trees with one discussion, and then both trees could merge it. Uh, but uh, it's, it's even more powerful, so the idea is that you can do arbitrary pulls to arbitrary trays, and so could do a pull request to the kernel, and to libdrm, and to Mesa, and to the X protocol repository, and the X server, and kind of do the entire user space to kernel end-to-end -end chain implementation. And, because it's still one thing, hand that off to CI, and CI would know all, all the branches it would need to pick from all the repositories, compile it together, give you the full stack, run the test suite. It's not implemented yet, but they're working on it. So just fundamentally, that GitLab, I think, does care a big, big project, whereas uh, GitHub and a lot of the others are much more optimized on small projects, single team, one repo, and essentially, the forks are just the private repos for uh, developers, but not like do not work as subprojects. So, uh, next few slides. It's just going through the various uh, features and what kind of works and what we think doesn't work and what might be useful and what we played around with it. What is the the merge request? And. The merge request is essentially a Git branch, including the ref load. So you see all the old versions, plus a target branch, uh, plus discussions and review, plus uh, CI status and CI results, all kind of integrated and smashed into one. So from a tracking and CI integration point of view, uh, really what we're looking for. Um, if you compare it to a pull request on the mailing list, almost all the things are there. You could do CI status as replies. 
and discussions obviously on the mailing list. Uh, the, the somewhat funny thing about the pull request is if you generate the pull request, you need to specify the target branch so it can generate the diff and the uh, diff step and all that on the, on the patch list, but it doesn't send it out. So the maintainer on the other side actually needs to know whether this is for fixes or for next or what exactly they need to do. So, so again, we kind of have a bit of semantic loss. Um, so from just uh, uh, information and tracking purpose, I think merge requests are fundamentally the thing we're looking for compared to patchwork where a bunch of these kind of additional things get lost and, and you don't have a nice overview of of all the previous revisions and the CR results, how that evolved and the discussions. Um, and the nice thing is also, so the Git ref lock is available uh, over the network and Git pull, so you can Git pull all the old versions and compare them and see if you reviewed version two, or you can grab that and grab version three and like compare it and see what, are they, what they actually changed. Oh, the problem with merge request Oh, here's one. Who's right? Oh. I'm sorry. You're all right. But this one doesn't work. Oh, yes, it does. Yeah. So who's, who's reflog? Because I develop exclusively with Git. I can't even understand my own damn reflog when I've lost something just because I keep developing, rebasing. This screws up on the CI. I have to rebase to include this patch. It's five depths deep. My reflog is incomprehensible. Yes. So how do you so build it's a comprehensible reflog? your reflog on the machine. It's... it's the merge request has its own ref lock. So only when you push, I mean, obviously, like some projects, like people push like all the time and essentially use the merge request as their developer ref lock, and then it's unreadable. But if, if, you, do, if you make a, con, uh, a conscious decision of now I'm going to publish this because I want other people to look at it, I want CI to look at it, uh, that, that's, so the merge request has its own, own ref lock. It's not your own chaos in a way. So the bigger problem is uh, uh, patch review. The, I think the biggest one is a lot of people get the 1,000 yards there and panic attacks if you button to take their email set up away because they invest a lot of time. Uh, but the other problem is also GitLab has only very recently added the concept of per patch review as a future, uh, future request for the GNOME people. And uh, the data model is there. If you're desperate enough, you can comment on individual patches, but the UI is just not there. So for the short to medium to probably a few years, I guess, until this is really useful, uh, I guess for the actual code review, uh, we, uh, we need to stick to mailing lists, at least for big patch series, for involved patch series, like in the kernel, or like long patch series in, in, in the OpenGL Vulkan stack. There's some smaller projects that use GitLab for review, as such as guinea pigs, and they're not too happy about it. So yeah, uh, I, I guess one for the entire patch submission review uh, problem, one medium term solution could be you use the merge request to just track the evolution of your submission and then have a little script that takes your latest merge request state, takes the cover letter that's also included in the merge request and dumps it onto the mailing list for review with a nice link inserted in the merge request that links to the mail archive for, for you, so it's all linked together. And you essentially use the merge request to track the evolution uh, maybe assign reviewers for manager to see what's going on and for CIA to dump the results into a nice place without spamming everyone. So, but we need to see how that works. Uh, a much nicer thing, I think, and we've played around quite a bit with this already, is, is CI in GitLab. Uh, you get it? Watch. Yeah, back on the, on the branch thing. Um, it's really well optimized for people when they have a series. Um, having to make a series out of single patches is a little unfortunate. So um, having a way to just merge a patch instead of doing a, you know, a, the whole rebasing merge approach that some teams use. Um, if you always have a merge commit for every single patch that you ever apply, um, it tends to get really noisy in the logs and stuff like that. 
And having a cover letter on a single patch doesn't really add value. You should have that in the patch description anyway. So having a way of doing all of this, but for the, for the you know, one, definitely for the one patch series, but maybe also two or maybe three patch series, doing a rebasing approach can be a useful consideration. So, I mean, using merge requests doesn't mean you need to use merge requests to merge stuff. A lot of projects use merge requests to gather CI results and discussions and all that stuff, and then use Git to have like the nice clean history. Yeah, okay, that's fair. I mean, it was and a premier presentation whether that was the plan. I know a bunch of the, um, I've used We don't commercial. have a whole lot of plans. We have a bunch of experiments. Having used commercial, you know, in-house, Git, Bitbucket, and all these, they usually have two modes. One is you do a merge, the other one is you do a rebase. And one is good sometimes, the other one is good in other times. Yeah. Um, so, so the thing I really like is, is the CI aspect. Uh, so every time you push to your own repo, to your merge request, whatever, uh, you can fire up an entire CI pipeline. You run, uh, well, you can specify Docker images and small scriptlets. You can build your own Docker images conditionally and only your Docker file being changed. So just from a design, uh, you have the dependencies and you can do entire flowcharts of first maybe build the Docker image, then build the thing, then run the test cases, then upload the things, uh, the, the results someday. Uh, you can build really nice CI infrastructures and you fully control the environment through the Docker images. So no more pains with client-side scripting and dealing with everyone's favorite distro. Uh, it also has support for special runners. So for example, the virtual GPU people uh, for the virtual GL driver, they have a special runner which happens to have a GPU. So they can run uh, the GPU test cases at full speed of, of hardware acceleration, don't need to fall back to software acceleration. Uh, the nice thing, again, it, this is a big rep of workflow, you have per project uh, a CI settings. I mean, in, in GitHub, you have one Travis CI file and everyone has to use it. And I don't think people would be happy if the DRM people would uh, occupy the one single CI file that you have. Whereas in GitLab CI, every fork, every repo, you can specify where that file is. You can have include directives. So the higher up level trees could include all the other uh, CI uh, pipelines from all the sub-projects sub and run them all, assuming you have enough sh machine time to do that. Uh, so this is all entirely CPU kind of virtual or CI. Uh, for testing real hardware for drivers, I would say you do not want to do that in the cloud because the box will, the, uh, the machines die all the time. That's kind of the point. So you need special hardware CI. Uh, you can feed these results into the overall merge request with a link to your results and status update. Like it's currently pending in the queue, it's currently running. Uh, it's, you can, force CI to block merging if you decide to use the, the, pardon, the, the UI merge flow. And the really nice thing, there's full transparency. Like you can watch your CI job run in the cloud while the thing is doing its thing. Uh, so from a, from a contributor point of view, I think the, the transparency of this is really nice. Uh, the downside is uh, Docker not so great. In theory, having these Docker images like, hey, I have perfect control over my build environment. Except if you want to build Docker images in Docker, uh, you need the root escape hatch, which is not so great for a shared hosting service. Uh, there's a bunch of things that aren't really namespaced or not set up yet. The, the admins need to make sure that your runners support it. Like we'd like to use KVM for both in kernels. Uh, we'd like to use bin format misc so we can cross compile to ARM and then run the ARM unit tests for user space stuff. Uh, just for security, I think we need the, the KVM containers, cut the containers thing long terms. Uh, uh, the FDO admins have lots of fun with clouds. I mean, they've never done this before, so they have all the, oops, the service is temporarily not available, and let's retie, or maybe not, and things don't work. Uh, so I think uh, once we get the setup uh, pain points out of the way and make this run well, um, uh, it's nice, but 
in theory, it's, it's like really nice to be fully in control of your build environment, not have to deal with everyone's uh, uh, distro and setup and all these things. But in practice, at least right now, after just half a year of playing around with it and quite a pile of projects adopting it, it's kind of not there yet. Another thing that I really like is lots of automation. I think a lot of projects uh, do really great things with guiding contributors along for their, con uh, their, their, their submissions, or making sure they follow all the little rules, automatically linking them to uh, documentation and things like that, and kind of relieving maintainers of doing the silly uh, repetitive work. Uh, that's done through webhooks, which requires a server somewhere there. And GitHub just recently announced actions where instead of a, uh, calling a webhook to a remote server, you just fire up a Docker image to run your stuff, uh, which GitLab does not yet have. But given that their entire CI infrastructure is built on Docker, I hope they, they fix that soon. And I think long term, that kind of automated maintainer bots that do the simple, silly things, uh, the, 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 the usual mistakes and ca of contributors and catching them without getting angry or frustrated or burned out. I think long term, that's going to be the biggest thing that we could, like looking at other projects, what we could do. Uh, there's also an issue tracker. The FD admins are a bit freaked out about your uh, privacy regulations because Bugzilla looks like it's a private submission, except that the other end it fans it out to a public mailing list, which is not so great because the user doesn't really realize that. We have a bunch of warnings, but they would like to sunset that. Uh, you can have per repo templates. So again, for big projects, you can have a bug repo template for Intel, a DRM Intel, one for DRM, AMD for DRM overall. So that's all. Pretty nice. Customization is entirely through labels. So a bit unstructured, but fairly powerful. Uh, timeline. Uh, most projects have moved over. On, uh, most hosts, uh, projects hosted on Free Desktop have moved over. Uh, the kernel repos are currently blocked on some infrastructure work. Uh, the admins don't want to host the big kernel repos uh, until they switched. Uh, Front end uh, until I switch the setup so that multiple front ends would run in parallel and, and automatically scale, so that the huge kernel history doesn't like take down the service for everyone else. There's lots of experimenting with CI. So in in in, in the past half years with migrating, there's been uh, 8,000 CI runs. This for our pipelines run. Uh, a bunch of projects have looked into issue uh, issue tracking migration. Was kind of lacking, and so quite a lot have uh, adopted the, or are experimenting around with merge requests. So somehow we have 3,000 merge requests already in all of XOR. Uh, so summary of the talk: I think patchwork is a solution to a self-inflicted problem, kind of with, with all the semantic loss. It, five years ago, I would have said this is nonsense. Patchwork is the solution to the problems we're having. Uh, and fundamentally, I really think you want to track the, the merge request, which has the full history, including the baseline, not just what you changed, and the target, and ideally also the history of all the, the old stuff. Uh, GitLab CI, I think, is awesome once we fully set it up. Uh, the entire cloud stuff is kind of not quite so awesome, or at least our admins need to learn quite a bit. Uh, on the automation front, I think GitLab has fallen behind uh, uh, compared to GitHub, at least. Not, I don't think there's any other uh, op fully open source solution that, that has anything close. And on the, on the patch review, I would say it's definitely current state is bad. It's not useful, usable for, for big patch series for complicated patches. Uh, but I do think. Uh, that has quite a bit of potential with being able to better track the ongoing discussions and carry over comments when uh, super enthusiastic people like resend your patch series five times while you try to review it so your, your old comments don't get immediately lost like kind of on a mailing list. So that's it. Questions?
Questions? So you now have patches with full context, not just three lines. So you, you will have. Oh, uh, I'm not. Patches I'm with the, not just three lines of context, but the full context. Like in a merge request, you don't have patches. You have the entire branch. Like the entire Git branch. OK, but when you review the changes, you can see the full context. You can review it. So I think you can look at the full file on the UI. OK. Could you then please move all of the kernel to this? Uh, I don't want to have that fight. <laughs> I mean, that, that's kind of the idea of the talk. It's just so we've been looking into this. The, as far as revolutions go, I think the, the overall free, uh, open source graphics people are super enthusiastic about this. A lot of people push really hard for this. And expect just from all the past examples, in a few years, graphic, kernel graphics might also at least adopt a bunch of these things. So you said at some point that when you do a merger into the main tree, we clean up all the history, right? And I think you are asking, can, do we have a mechanism for pre preserving all of the history that we have in the kernel, which is the multiple patch submissions, the cover letters, and everything else? And I think the answer is either yes or no, and I didn't quite get what it is. Do we lose the history on a merge in GitLab, or do we keep it? As in, all of the ref log type history. Um. So I mean, if you do a merge in the li in the Git history, the ref log is obviously not there. But but it's it's kept on GitHub like as long as we keep the servers alive, which is. Ah, uh, it's special refs. It's special. So uh, I mean, if, if, if uh, in, in the Git uh, repo, you can have refs heads. And I think there's refs merge requests. And it's there, like tags. Right. So what, you, what you're saying is there's a view of the tree that is completely clean like the kernel is. But in parallel, because of the process, we keep a set of magic branches yeah. or magic Git notes or whatever that actually have all this history in, which is what I think you were asking about. No, I, think, I think it was different. You can just look more than three lines Um, since you have very little time, maybe we move this to the hallway track, and if there's other questions. Yeah, I have one. <coughs> so if someone wants to offer their CI to other company like a GitLab, one of the concerns they may have is the prioritization of your phone features. Have you ever like needed a new feature and then requested that to GitLab, and how, that, how did that go? Uh, Git, yeah. GitLab does actually take public contributions at a regular uh, pace. Uh -huh. So if you really want it, I do think you can like have the, the, they do all the, so it's not just the DCO plus MIT, they do all their design discussions in public. The only thing that's private or mocked private is kind of customer sales uh, relevant stuff. But you see, they, know, they reference a private issue that you can't see. But all the technical discussion is in public. All the merge requests are in public. And there's quite a few people who do contribute externally to GitLab and make things happen. So if you desperately want a feature, I do think you can make it happen. I mean, there's the question of the open core. And if you just re-implement exactly the feature they already have, they might, yeah. I, I don't know what the discussions there will, will pan out. But in general. They're very open to external contributions right now. Might always change with them. I, I think when the GNOME when the free desktop guys came to them originally, they were, they were like saying, we'll give you the enterprise edition. And they were like, no, no, we don't want the enterprise edition. We want to use the open one. But we'd like this feature for the enterprise edition. And they, they did actually were open to discussion about moving certain features out of their enterprise into their core just to support this. So there, 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 been, there's been pretty good interactions with them as a group overall. So. Yeah. Yeah. So right now they're very supportive, kind of GNOME, uh, Debian, and us adopting GitLab. But of course, like this might change 
rather quickly, so we're not banking on it. Right, Time up. Thanks a lot for listening and Thanks, hang out.